Well, this morning uh, we are beginning a new series in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Uh, We have uh, decided to change our preaching schedule for the rest of the year, in fact, over the next several years, uh, to accommodate uh, this kind of impromptu series in 1 Corinthians uh, that was brought about uh, from our Q&A Sunday a few weeks ago. So if you'd like to open up with me in your Bibles, we're going to open up to Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. We're going to be reading from chapter 1, verses uh, 1 through 9 this morning. This is the opening uh, of the letter, and it is God's word to you this morning. So listen now, church, for what the Spirit says to you. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. mentioned just a little while ago that the traditional uh, greeting during this time of the year is uh, the Easter greeting uh, in the high church tradition, uh, which would be like Anglican or Lutheran or Roman Catholic. Uh, The season of Easter uh, lasts from the Resurrection Sunday all the way until Pentecost Sunday, which is uh, 50 days uh, after Easter. And so during this time of year, we continue to use uh, that traditional Christian greeting of Eastertide, uh, which is, he is risen, and the response is, he is risen indeed. So let us say it together, he is risen, he is risen indeed. Today we are beginning uh, to take a look at Paul's first letter uh, to the Corinthians. Uh, We'll be in this uh, basically through up until uh, Advent of this coming year. Uh, And so we'll be looking uh, today at this beginning uh, of the letter. Corinth uh, was a city uh, in Greece. In fact, there's a city that's still called Corinth in Greece, although it is not where the ancient city of Corinth was. Uh, And the city of Corinth at the time of Paul was not where the city of Corinth was even 200 years before Paul wrote to them. Corinth was a city on the move in some ways quite literally. City was, uh, the city of Corinth was rebuilt by Julius Caesar uh, in the year 44 BC. And if we take a look at the geography, uh, it's pretty easy to understand uh, what's going on here. So what you're looking at uh, here is a map of the Christian world uh, at about the end of the first century AD. Uh, but if we zoom in on Greece, Uh, we can get an idea of where Corinth is. Corinth sits at this little isthmus, this little strip of land in between the Ionian and the uh, Aegean seas. Uh, And as a result, uh, you could save a lot of time shipping uh, if you were to go through the port of Corinth uh, on one side and then on the other side, the port of Sinatria, Uh, And you could save a lot of time and indeed a lot of lives because shipping in the ancient world was quite dangerous. If you've been in our Jonah study, I've talked to you about ancient sailing uh, and just how dangerous this stuff is. Uh, Well, Corinth was a city that was perfectly in a perfect position for economic uh, viability, but more than that, for an economic boomtown. And it was a port city. Uh, And as a port city, it had all of the problems that you usually get with port cities. People coming and going all of the time. The mixing of ideas and cultures all of the time. But also sin, especially sexual immorality. 
the ancient uh, city of Corinth around the time of Paul. This is an artist's rendition of what it might have looked like. Uh, this would be like the downtown area in Corinth. Uh, you can see in here several temples, including a temple to Apollos, a temple to Athena, uh, and of course the imperial cult because this was a Roman colony. Julius Caesar uh, resettles the city in 44 BC because in 146 BC the city had been destroyed by the Romans uh, as a move to subjugate the people of the region of Achaia. Uh, in essence, it was a warning shot said, you will come under our reign or we will destroy you. This is the Pax Romana. Uh, in the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome is something like this, do what we say or you die. It's tyranny. Uh, and tyranny certainly can bring stability, but it brings stability out of fear and terror. And fear and terror are things, as Christians, we need to reject as legitimate um, methods of rule. Well, this is what Corinth looked like, as according to an artist about that time. Uh, it was a modern Roman city, which meant it would have been a mini Rome. It would have had all of the features you would find in Rome, including a marketplace, a stadium, a theater. Uh, but just outside of Corinth, and you can't see this on here, sitting up on a hill above it in what is often called Acro Corinth, uh, was the ancient temple of Aphrodite, the goddess Venus. And there, at this ancient temple, uh, they practice something called temple prostitution, which is exactly what you think it is. Uh, and as a result, sexual morality was not simply something that happened in the city of Corinth. It was integrated into their culture. It was part of who they were. So it is an amazing thing that happens uh, to the Apostle Paul in 51 AD when he comes upon the city of Corinth. Now, just prior to coming to Corinth, the Apostle uh, had visited uh, the city of Athens. Uh, and there he had gone to the Arapacus, or, or uh, in, in English, the Mars Hill. Uh, he'd gone up Mars Hill, which would have been something along the lines of an ancient university. Up at the top, this is where the philosophers met, uh, the Platonists and the Aristotelians and the Stoics and the Cynics and the Epicureans, right? All of these ancient philosophies, which you all probably have heard of, but may not know a lot about. Well, Paul had gone up there, he had seen a shrine to an unknown God, and he had begun to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, and things seem to be going pretty well for the apostle until he begins to speak about the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, and there in Acts 17, when he begins to speak about the resurrection of Jesus, uh, he is openly mocked for it. A few people do come to faith. We're told not many, but a few come to faith in Athens. Uh, and we're given a few of those names. Uh, and then Paul quickly exits Athens, which is not his usual practice of planting churches. And so one of the reasons for this, or, and it's a somewhat controversial opinion on my part, uh, is that Paul's Athens ministry, what he had hoped to have happen, his mission to Athens, which he thought he's going to convert the philosophers, and then he'll convert all of Greece, because these men will begin to proclaim the gospel themselves. These are the best and brightest of Greece. Uh, it doesn't pan out. It just doesn't work out. And so Paul leaves Athens and continues down uh, through Achaia and ends up in the next city, major city along the route, uh, which would be Corinth. And again, Corinth is not a city of great learning. Corinth is a city of commerce. It's a city of working people and business people. It's a city of longshoremen. It's a city of people who are working in the shipping industry. That's the city of Corinth. And the amazing thing that God does right, is that God says, look, Paul, you need to stay here in Corinth. And Paul stays there for 18 months, which is just about longer than anywhere but perhaps Ephesus. He stays there for 18 months getting this church up and running. He's able to convert some prominent people in the city. And even when persecution breaks out against, say, a man named Sosthenes, which I'm going to go ahead and wager is the same Sosthenes who is mentioned at the start of our letter today. Even when persecution breaks out against these converts, the church continues to grow and be strong. 
but the church is not without problems. One of its major problems is, of course, there is this culture, this pagan culture that is surrounding it, a pagan culture that is going to place uh, emphasis on being the best and the brightest, a pagan culture that's going to place emphasis on personal autonomy, and especially uh, on the idea that I should be able to get whatever I want for myself and that other people should recognize how powerful and great I am and submit to my authority. These are all problems that are present uh, in our letter, first letter to the Corinthians and problems that Paul will have to address uh, with them because the way of King Jesus is not the way of the pagan world. The way of King Jesus is the way of grace and peace. And this is a very different way to live in the world uh, than what we find in Corinth at the time Paul was writing to it or that we find in the world today. Grace and peace mean that I put myself in a position of servanthood to others. And that whatever gifts I have, whatever abilities I have, whatever power I have, it is not to be used to subjugate others to my will. It is not to be used to make me a petty tyrant. We're seeing lots of that right now, aren't we? It is to be used to serve others and specifically to serve others as Christians in this one particular way, to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to build up the church, and to make new believers through the proclamation of the gospel. We use the gifts that we have been given, the powers, the abilities, the talents we have been given for the benefit of others. That's what Paul is going to be writing to the Corinthians, and that's where they're having trouble. Now, we uh, are pretty certain that Paul is writing uh, this letter to the Corinthians uh, from the city of Ephesus, which would have been across the Aegean Sea from Corinth. Uh, he's writing uh, in, into Corinth uh, sometime in the spring of 53, 54, or 55. You would say, well, can't we get more precise than that? And the answer is no, we can't. We know he's writing in the spring based upon some evidence of some holidays upcoming, but we don't know exactly which one of those years uh, the letter is written from. We do know that there are other letters that are written to the Corinthians, uh, we have one of them extant in the canonical scriptures, Second Corinthians, but both of the letters make mention of other letters that are written back and forth. And while these are probably important to understand some context, uh, they are lost to us in history and they are not part of the canonical scriptures. The only two letters that are preserved are the two we find here, First and Second Corinthians. These letters are going to cover a wide range of issues going on in the Corinthian church. I mentioned a few of them. One is how do we use the gifts that we are given by the Holy Spirit? Uh, and the answer that Paul is going to give is you use them for the benefit of others, not for your own uh, ability to build yourself up. We build up others, not the self. A second issue that's going to come up over and again is how do we uh, respond ethically in the way of King Jesus uh, to issues that are facing the church? Should we call each other into court? Is sexual uh, immorality okay because of grace? Uh, can we eat food sacrificed to idols? How do we behave ethically in a world that does not support our faith? And I think increasingly for Christians today, these are questions we need to be asking and answers we need to be hearing from the Scripture. What do we do with the gifts, talents, abilities, and powers that we are given by God as Christians? How do we live ethically in a world that does not support our worldview in the way of King Jesus? These are the issues we'll be looking at as we continue through Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. But let's take a look at our passage uh, today, which is the opening of our letter. Now, the letter opens, uh, as it usually does, with Paul identifying himself. This is one of the things I always appreciate about ancient letters more than modern letters, uh, is an ancient letter begins with telling you uh, from whom the letter is from. Uh, and, and I think I said from twice there. <laughs> <laughs> the letter is from Paul, right? 
Uh, if you look at a modern letter, you have to get to the bottom of the letter before you realize who it's from. Of course, most of us have read the return address, but the letter is from Paul, and Paul identifies himself that he is called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. Paul identifies himself very clearly that the reason that he is doing what he is doing is not because he is really talented at proclaiming the gospel. Indeed, he is going to have a very low opinion of his own ability in proclaiming the gospel. Uh, he's going to tell the Corinthians that he does not come to them with eloquence of words. Right? There's another evangelist by the name of Apollos. You can meet him uh, in the book of Acts, for instance. Uh, and Apollos is a wonderful public speaker. He is a very good rhetorician. And if you want to hear good preaching, you tune in to him. But Paul is saying, I'm not here because I have all of this talent and ability and I'm just so good at what I'm doing. I'm, I'm here because God has called me to do this. It is God's will that has made me an apostle. How does Paul know that? Because in Acts chapter 9, he's knocked off his horse by blinding light. And he is called into the ministry by Christ Jesus himself. When Paul says he is here to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, it's because that is literally what has happened in his life. Paul has a mission, and his mission is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ where it has not been proclaimed before, and to make believers and form churches. One of the things we have to understand very clearly in Paul's letters, all of them, 1 Corinthians in particular, but all of them, uh, is that Paul is writing to people, people gathered in churches that are organized. Uh, and to try to think we can get rid of an organized church uh, and think that in any stretch of imagination we're holding to New Testament uh, theology is, is simply ridiculous. So the apostle is called by the will of God. He knows that it is God who has set him apart and called him out to proclaim the gospel. Paul is joined in the letter by Sosthenes. Right? And we meet a man named Sosthenes in Acts chapter 18, uh, verse 17. Uh, and there, Sosthenes is beaten, presumably by unbelieving Jews. Sosthenes was a leader of the synagogue in Corinth. Uh, and the idea there is that Sosthenes most likely has made a conversion uh, to Christianity. Is this the same Sosthenes? Well, the jury is out on that. The name is not that uncommon in the ancient world. However, given its connection with Corinthians, it is best to probably think that this is the same Sosthenes who has now joined Paul on his mission uh, to Ephesus. We then learn to whom the letter is addressed. Uh, and here, the apostle is very clear. The letter is addressed to the church of God that is in Corinth. Church means the assembly or the gathering. Uh, and there, the church, the gathering of God, is the particular one in Corinth. Uh, we could talk about the church in Omac, and we certainly could say that there were several different congregations meeting in Omac digitally, probably this morning. But there is one church one church, just as there were many house churches in Corinth, as we know there were in Rome at the time that Paul is writing, they still constitute one church in Corinth, one church. So Paul is writing to them and addressing them as a whole. Now, in the hyper-individualistic, and again, this is not individual responsibility culture as we might have today, but rather this is individual absolutism, as in, I am the most important person in the world and you should all do what I say because I'm so wonderful, which is a horrible thing for the Christian to engage in. Paul is writing and reminding them that they belong together that the church is a gathering of people, that there are no star players in the church. We are one body, and everybody has a part to play. He then reminds them that their sanctification is coming from Christ Jesus. Uh, we had our ministerial committee meet this week, and we did some examinations uh, of people wanting to be pastors. And one of the questions uh, I asked was, uh, from, where do, from whence does our sanctification come? 
Because one of the dangers we can get into is moralism. And moralism is something along the lines of Jesus has saved you, now it's up to you to live a moral life. And by living a moral life, you will become holy. Well, the Apostle Paul says that is not what happens. Instead, what we are told is we are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Your sanctification is the consistent application of the grace of Jesus Christ to your life. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what's going on. Each and every day, the Spirit applies grace to you. And by this, you are set apart more and more in Christ Jesus for salvation and indeed for glory. Well, they are called to be saints. Saints means the holy ones. So you're sanctified in Christ Jesus, and what is the effect of your sanctification? You are called to be holy. But then we are told that the church is larger than Corinth. Just like today, we would certainly be clear that the church is larger than OMAC, and the Christians gathered here this morning. We are called together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. We are a community of saints, and we belong one to another. Then the apostle turns to his traditional greeting, and his traditional greeting is found in all of his letters uh, to the churches. And the idea here, and this is rather important, is since this is formulaic, and we see it so often, uh, we can glance over it like it's not that big a deal. But the entirety of Paul's theology, the entirety of his understanding of the gospel is contained in this greeting. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is receiving from God what we do not deserve, namely adoption and forgiveness Grace is receiving from God acceptance into his family, salvation in his name. And by this grace, we are given peace with God. We are no longer at war and in rebellion with the God who made us. Rather, we have a living relationship with him. And this living relationship with him through Jesus Christ is what sustains us in the days before us. And it is this living relationship that will last into all eternity when Jesus Christ comes in glory. Grace and peace are the point. But this grace and peace, as we have to remember, is something we share together as a community. The you here is plural, y'all. Grace to y'all and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we must remember that this is something we do together. Our faith is a team sport, even as we individually participate. Well, the prayer that follows after this largely is an expansion on those two main ideas, grace and peace. Grace has cause, namely God, through Christ Jesus, dying on the cross for us and for our salvation, but it also has effect. And the effect for Paul is first to give thanks for those who believe. And we should thank God for the church. We should thank God for our fellow believers, for those who are being sanctified with us. For we share one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And because of this, we should thank God for one another perhaps more than we do. If you are finding yourself with extra time on your hands these days, and I think most of us are, Perhaps spending some time in prayer giving thanks to God for others would be a good use of it. Well, this grace, as we've mentioned before, is given by God through Jesus Christ to his church, and it has a number of effects. First, it is a reason to give thanks. We can always give thanks when people receive grace from God. When people receive the grace of Jesus Christ and they become believers, your first reaction should be to give thanks to God. Second, the effect of grace is to enrich us in Christ Jesus. So if grace's first effect is to make new believers, its second effect is to build up believers in Jesus Christ. Grace is con- continues to be what you need in your life to grow as a follower of Jesus. 
It enriches us in our speech, which is how we communicate with the world. It enriches us because we are able to communicate the gospel more and more each and every day. As we study the word, as we pray, as we come to know Jesus and follow after him more, your speech, your ability to proclaim the gospel will grow. This doesn't mean you'll become a world-class rhetorician or orator. Rather, it means that because you have an authentic living relationship relationship with Jesus Christ, it will become easier to tell others about it and to invite them to join in that relationship as well. But we also grow in knowledge. We grow in our knowledge of the truth, the truth that is in Christ Jesus. We grow in this knowledge because we study God's word. We come to know Jesus more. We come to see how God's word applies to our lives and leads us to live in a particular way in the world in the grace of Jesus Christ. So as you grow in his grace, you will grow in your speech and knowledge so that you will confirm the testimony of Christ among us. You will say, I... Never thought I knew Jesus before, now, and I know I will know him better later. Your knowledge of Jesus will grow. Your relationship with him will grow. And as you do it, you will say, I thought I had this salvation thing figured out. I thought I knew what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. I thought I knew the depth of God's love for me displayed on the cross of Jesus Christ. But what I knew was nothing compared to what I know now. The grace I had is but a pittance of the grace that I actually have now. And that process will continue throughout your life. You will constantly be coming back to this moment where you say, I thought I knew it. I thought I had it figured out. I thought I knew exactly how powerful was the love of God for me in Christ Jesus. I thought my faith was as powerful as it could be. It was able to sustain me through difficult and and trying times. I thought my hope was secure. And yet, there is always more. And we can look back over time and we can say, when I thought I was at the peak, I was nowhere near it. Because there was always higher up and further in, according to C.S. Lewis. This is what is yours in Christ Jesus. And as you grow in his grace, as your peace with God becomes more manifest in your life, you will confirm the testimony of Christ that you are a redeemed sinner, that you are a saint a holy one of God. And you will live in his grace and grow in his grace for all eternity. Because you have peace with God. So the purpose of your peace with God is to bring you into the family of God, to bring us together to belong to God The purpose of peace is that we will not lack in anything that we need. The gifts here, Paul will expound upon uh, throughout the letter, but most especially in chapters 12, 13, and 14. These gifts he will talk about, the Corinthians uh, make kind of a sport on trying to decide which are the best gifts, and because these people have the best gifts, then they're the best Christians, and the rest of us should all just submit to their authority in our lives. Apostle Paul's take on this is that it's nonsense. There are no required gifts, and there are no gifts that are better than others. Every single person has been given gifts because we have peace with God. The purpose of your peace is to equip you for the mission of the gospel in the world. You, do know, you no longer have to worry about your relationship with God, about making peace with God. That's a term we use culturally today, don't we? You have peace with God. And the purpose of having peace with God is to equip you to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in a world gone wrong. But the purpose of this peace one more time is also to give you those three things that matter more than anything else, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 13. Those three things that remain are faith, 
hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. It is these three gifts above all else, faith, hope, and love, that will sustain you in your relationship with God, in your peace with God, until Jesus Christ comes in glory. The revealing of Jesus Christ is not merely the revealing of Jesus Christ to you in salvation. Rather, we are appointed here toward the great day of the Lord, what the Apostle Paul calls the day of our Lord Jesus Christ in a pretty clever change uh, from the Old Testament use of the day of the Lord to identify the Lord with Jesus Christ here. This great day of the Lord, it's judgment day. It's the day of reckoning. It's the day when Christ comes in glory to judge the living and the dead. And the purpose of your faith, hope, and love, your peace and grace, is to sustain you and bring you to that day. But one more thing. It is also to present you guiltless on that day. Because you rest not on your own ability not on your own works, not on your own gifts, not on how great you are, but on how great is your salvation in Christ Jesus. You rest upon His grace and in His peace alone on that day. If you are to be found guiltless on the day of judgment, it is because Christ's righteousness is put upon you in faith. Paul ends his opening prayer by reminding us that grace and peace are things we experience together as a community. You are called into community. I know this is a trying time to see that as you're arrayed around your phone or tablet or computer, but the church is a community. We belong together. It's in our name. We usually give you a nice abbreviation, CPC OMAC, because it rolls off the tongue, But the name of this congregation is Community Presbyterian Church. Community is in our name, and it was chosen for a reason. It was chosen because when this church was originally founded, it was founded as the Presbyterian Community Church of OMAC. We were told that we couldn't use a precursor name when we were invited to change our name when we left our old denomination. And by invited, I mean forced. So we couldn't use the name First Presbyterian Church any longer, which was what we changed our name to. Uh, And I said, well, if we can't be Presbyterian Community Church, could we be Community Presbyterian Church? And our former presbytery didn't have a problem with that. We chose this church because when this church was founded, it was founded to belong to the community. But more than that, to also be a gathered community of the saints here in OMAC. We are called into a community by our faithful God. We are called into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And this is something we do together. As hard as it is to see where we're at in the church today, as hard as it is to understand us as belonging to community, one of the things we need to see clearly, one of the things we need to long for, is a reunion at the end of all of this. A reunion that certainly will come on the day that Jesus Christ comes in glory to judge the living and the dead, a grand reunion which will last forever of all the saints from every time and place. But here and now, we can long for and pray for a restoration to community because God's will for our lives is to live together in our faith, hope, and love in Jesus Christ. We are called to practice grace, peace, faith, hope, love together as we grow and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. A few ideas as we conclude. First, receive the grace and peace of the Father and the Son through the Spirit and faith. Today you stumbled upon our live stream. If someone invited you to come and take a look, if you're watching us sometime later, I would be remiss if I did not invite you into a living relationship with Jesus Christ. We begin our life, our eternal life, through faith in Jesus. Here at Community Presbyterian Church, we talk about surrendering to Jesus Christ in faith. We come to Jesus, wretched and poor, with nothing to offer, and yet we receive everything by His grace. 
How do we do that? You put your trust in him. You proclaim that he is your king. And you say that you will follow where he leads. You believe what the scriptures clearly teach. That Christ Jesus gave himself on the cross for your salvation. And that God raised him from the dead. And you long for that grand reunion with Christ Jesus. And all the saints in glory. Surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And receive grace and peace from God our Father. And through the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And in the power of the Holy Spirit. Second, because of the current situation in which we find ourselves, I'm going to say you have time now to really seek to grow in your faithful proclamation of the gospel and your knowledge of Christ. If you've been wondering, what am I to do with all of this time? Well, a lot of people have answered that question by doing a lot of yard work. But as a pastor, I want to say, ask the question, how can I use my time to give glory to God. And one of the ways is to prepare yourself to be a better proclaimer of the gospel. That would mean coming to know God's word more. And I'm going to say something that shouldn't be controversial, but it's just crazy enough to work. If you want to know God's word better, open it up and read it. Now, I've tried uh, my, in my own life to put a book under my pillow one time, hoping that the knowledge would leak into my head. It didn't work out so well. You can leave your Bible on your shelf gathering dust and say, well, at least I have a Bible in the house. But it only works if you open it up and read it. Come to know God's word. Be led by God's word into deep prayer. You can read through and pray with Paul in verses 4 through 9 here today. Pray for the church. Give thanks to the church. Give thanks to God. That's what you can do with your time. Grow in your knowledge of Christ and your ability to proclaim his gospel. Because there are people that are scared right now. You might be one of them. People who are seeing that the world that they thought they understood is falling apart around them. The security they thought they had, whether it's from a job or a government or whatever, isn't as secure as we thought. We have 22 million people in this country who were thrown out of work by no fault of their own. People are bewildered, scared, and you have the one thing that they need. You have peace with God. Consider carefully God's word and meet people with the truth of the gospel. Finally, be a person of grace and peace in a world gone wrong. Do gracious things for others. Display the grace that you have in Jesus Christ by giving grace to others. Make peace, for then you will be called a son of God. In our family devotions this week, we return to a, a devotion book we've been using, and we're in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount, and we were talking about the Beatitudes and my daughters, I told them they all had to memorize one and they all picked the same one. Blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called sons of God. Be a peacemaker. In a world of crisis and turmoil, be somebody who doesn't simply maintain or keep peace, but makes peace. Be a forgiving and gracious person who makes peace. And in this way, you confirm the grace and peace you have in Christ Jesus. And when you proclaim that you have received grace and peace from God as a gracious peacemaker, people will say, perhaps this is someone I should listen to. Finally, live in faith, hope, and love. And invite others to do the same. In a time when people are afraid, there are no greater gifts to the church than faith, hope, and love. Because by these, we overcome the world in Christ Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people say, Amen.